to the Alchemical Tech Revolution, and I am your host, Wayne McCroy. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're going to discuss Paracelsus and the Elementals. We'll be reading tonight primarily from a book by Manly P. Hall. I believe this was published sometime in the 1920s, if I'm not mistaken. And it's called Paracelsus, His Mystical and Medical Philosophy. 
And from this book, we're going to read into a portion of it here that focuses upon the idea of Paracelsus and his thoughts on the elemental forces that work here in nature. So with that being the case, there's a lot of interesting ideas to explore, and we have done an entire series on the unseen forces of this world in the past here. This is not merely a repetition of those same things. This is actually what Paracelsus's take on this whole thing was. And we're going to explore a little bit more into the natural forces that play into our world here. How this all works and how there's an intelligence behind these things in the natural world. This is not just ra random happenstance out there, folks. These things just did not accidentally all come together and here we are. Like the scientists or the scientismists of the day would like you to believe that billions of years ago nothing exploded and became everything somehow mysteriously. Through no unsolicited guiding force or guiding intelligence, that's not the case at all. Many of the ancient alchemists and the old philosophers very much acknowledged that there were intelligent forces at play. Now, they may not be of the same ilk of intelligence as human beings or as God the Creator, but there are definitely intelligences that guide various things here in the natural world. And this is what we're going to explore. So Paracelsus took a common sense approach to this, and we're going to talk about those things. So without further ado, let's get into this, and we'll talk about invisible creatures of the elements. Paracelsus gained enduring distinction as a patron of forlorn causes. He advanced and defended beliefs, opinions, and doctrines unpopular in his own day, and even less acceptable to the mind of the 20th century, and I'll add the 21st century as well. 16th century Europe is now regarded as superstition-ridden, and doctrines then ha held as valid subjects for scientific consideration have been totally rejected, or at least allowed to languish in dignified oblivion. As we have noted before, Paracelsus chose to gather his friends and acquaintances from among the peasantry. He liked to visit hermits living in huts and caves, and to explore the myths and legends of the gypsies, alchemists, herbalists, and even magicians and sorcerers. He was convinced that the folk beings flourishing in isolated regions had valid origin and meaning for those who had the wit and wisdom to examine them with open and charitable attitudes. We are inclined today to agree with Paracelsus, accepting ancient symbols and ideas not as mere inventions, fabrications, or delusions, but as revealing the deeper phases of human consciousness, much as we regard dreams and visions as testimony to the inner life of the individual. So I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So Paracelsus preferred the company of the peasantry, the common people. He wasn't one of these snooty elitist types. He preferred the company of hermits, and, you know, I'll tell you what, the older I get, the more I understand the hermits. <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, I, I like living out in the country in the middle of nowhere. I would rather not be bothered by people most of the time, so uh, that I could definitely relate to, especially when you're dealing with the types of people that we deal with in today's society. And I, I think you all understand what I'm talking about here. So sometimes you, you feel a little better to be away from that kind of mindset. Because these mindsets, they are kind of one of those things that will latch on to people who may not want those mindsets and affect you in certain ways. could affect your attitude, your spirit. So it's good to keep yourself separated from the negativity, if you can. But we still have to live in this world. We're not of this world, as we're guided by the Bible, but we must live in this world. So, therefore, we do have to make amends and, and try to get along with our fellow human beings and perhaps guide them in the right ways. But I do understand the stance of the hermits, and I understand Paracelsus would rather hang out with the regular folk than with the elitist scumbags. Kudos to him for that. 
Anyway, let's continue on. All over the world, people of every race and class and belonging to many levels and degrees of intelligence have affirmed the reality of creatures in nature other than those with which we are commonly acquainted. The mythologies of the Persians, Mongolians, Chinese, Japanese, Hindus, and Egyptians abound with accounts of spirits, benevolent or malevolent, who occasionally involve themselves in the affairs of ordinary mortals. The Greeks had their nymphs and dryads, sprites of fountain and forest. The ancient druids had their th tree spirits inhabiting the sacred groves. And the Teutonic tribes never questioned the reality of the Nibelungen folk, gnomes and earth dwarves who guarded lost treasures. Although Paracelsus never reached Ireland, he would have found there the same respect for leprechauns who pegged shoes in forest glades, and fairies like the airy people of A Midsummer Night's Dream, who held court in meadows and whose dances caused fairy rings of bright flowers. Of course, Paracelsus did not actually invent his explanations relating to elementals and elementaries. Gonna pause for a moment here, folks. Many people do attribute Paracelsus with the first or earliest descriptions of elementals, and that's not necessarily the case. Other earlier cultures have described these same things, maybe in slightly different forms or slightly different words, but the, the concept has always been there. Paracelsus just brought it into the modern era a little bit more. And many of these things have actually been thrown out in the modern era, as we see here. Many people will not even take these kinds of ideas into consideration these days because we've been so inculcated with this idea of science as the be-all, end-all of observational methods. We've discounted the idea 100% that there might be some type of an intelligent force guiding different actions in this world. Instead, they look at mere cause and reaction scenarios within the physical span of things. That's not necessarily the most accurate way to look at things. We're, we're leaving behind some very important ideas when we lose the philosophical, when we're observing different phenomena here in this world. So that being the case, I think it's important that we recognize this, and Paracelsus very much understood this and recognized this, as did many people in the ancient cultures, and especially when you get to the different cultures that were maybe a little bit more separated from others, and they have very similar types of stories, fairy stories and myths and things of this nature that relate the same ideas, just in with different names and slightly different descriptions. We have all of this stuff. If you uh, go and look at the land of Ireland, this is rife with different fairy stories and things like leprechauns, and this is where the ideas come from, from a lot of that. But every culture has some iteration of this. So is there actually some type of a natural spirit phenomena that is out there that guides different processes in the natural world? I think it's a very legitimate question to ask, isn't it? And it's a very legitimate avenue of thought to explore. So this is what Paracelsus did. This is what uh, many of the alchemists did. And as a result, we could understand a little something better by just looking at the way they logicked all this out. And Paracelsus put together a framework here that we use in the modern time. But it's a misnomer to think that he's the original one that came up with the idea of the elemental. So with that being said, let's continue reading here. Of course, Paracelsus did not actually invent his explanations relating to elementals and elementaries. He merely adapted them from the writings of the Egyptians and other learned nations of the ancient world. On one occasion, Socrates, desiring to discourse with his disciples, chose a certain shaded and secluded place because the spirits that inhabited it would contribute to the dignity and richness of the occasion. Iamblichus, in his work on the mysteries, mentions attending spirits, some of which are associated with a person from his birth and became, or become his protectors. This concept, which returns in Christian theology as the guardian angel, is not regarded as contrary to the doctrines of the church. Paracelsus was a devout man and drew much of his inspiration from the Bible and early commentaries thereon. He was therefore not a stranger to the scriptures or the miracles and mysterious appearances 
which they set forth. He came to the conclusion that the subject of submundanes, or non-human beings in nature, did not conflict with the orthodox inclinations of pious persons. In the Archidoxus, he tells us that there are two kinds of substances in nature, two kinds of bodies, which he quaintly describes when he says, quote, there is a flesh from Adam, and there is also a flesh that is not from Adam, end quote. He goes on to say that Adamic flesh is composed of the mingling of the four basic elements that were known to the ancients. We must bear in mind that our modern theory of elements is far more complicated than the older concept. The four elements of the ancients were earth, water, fire, and air, and the flesh of Adam is composed of a mingling of these four elements. Thus, in the human body, there is a physical or mineral part, a vegetative or humid part, a fiery principle sustaining warmth and motion, and an airy or gaseous principle, often related to the structure of the intellect. Thus the human body is made up of solids, liquids, gases, and a fiery principle. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So this is what the philosophers are talking about when they're saying that the human being is composed of these four different elements. And this was a pretty good description here given by Manley P. Hall, and this is how Paracelsus saw it as well. So, this being the case, it's thinking in a more commonsensical type of a way, dividing things into simpler types of delineations, rather than making them overly complex like our periodic table of elements is today. It's overly complex, and although we do have these different substances, well, they're all made of the same basic components, aren't they? They're, they're all made of atoms, right? different combinations of atoms, and if you look at what is the basic atom, the basic atom is the hydrogen atom, so many various combinations of the hydrogen atom can make up these many varied things. So this is more towards the philosophical principle of the elements, and it seems to be a handier way of looking at things, a more simplistic way of looking at things, because here's the trick with nature. It operates on simple principles. It is not overly complicated. It's human beings that complicate the matter here. That's wherein the problem lies. We overly complicate everything. We make convoluted, complex systems out of something that is inherently simple if you just stand back and observe it with common sense. And we're so good at this, especially modern science. They love to break everything down into the minutia of detail to the point where they, they lost they lost the whole meaning of things or, or understanding on a, a basic level of the various natural phenomena that happen in this world. Uh, so that being the case, we could look back and see these more simplistic ways of thinking and understand there was a true understanding there from some of these people. They understood these different forces, these different types of elements existed and that the combinations thereof produced various phenomena. And understanding that, they had a basic working model of how many of these things go come into play here in the physical reality. But they also understood that there had to be a guiding intelligence behind that. So therefore, they had some pretty interesting ideas about all of it. And it flies in the face of what our modern science would have us believe. But it's still, I think, something that's worthy of consideration here. Because there's so much our modern science cannot explain. And even a lot of these old philosophies still cannot explain certain things. There's always this air of mystery about it. And that's what makes life beautiful, isn't it? So anyway, let's continue reading on. Some of the Kabbalists held that the four rivers described in Genesis as flowing out of the Garden of Eden represent the streams of energy sustaining the four primordial elements. These elements again were symbolized by the four fixed signs of the zodiac, Taurus the bull, representing earth, Scorpio the scorpion, representing water, Leo the lion, representing fire, and Aquarius, sometimes called the water bearer, an electrical kind of fluid associated with the spirit of air. 
These elements later became identified with the four corners of the world and in Christianity with the four apostles or evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In art, these evangelists were often pictured accompanied by the fixed signs of the zodiac. And I'm going to pause for a moment there, folks. So you see, there's so many foundational things built into our world based upon these elemental ideas, and they have been correlated over to religious doctrine as well. As we can see here, even astronomy, astrology, we have these four fixed signs of the zodiac, and we do have these elemental ideas attached to them. Now we have 12 zodiacal symbols overall, there's three fire, three water, three earth, and three air symbols in the current system that we go by. So you have all of these elements included in that type of a system as well. So they're reflected above. So as above, so below, as the old hermetic axiom goes. We have the same things going on here. So these forces take uh, a, a position in the heavens as well as here on the earth. So they have their place there as well, as we'll see here. So let's continue reading and see what else Mr. Manly P. Hall has to tell us about the teachings and the knowledge of Paracelsus as it pertains to these elemental ideas. Man, descending from Adam and receiving his body from the Adamic flesh, lives in four elementary spheres at the same time. He has dominion over these elements, with the power to control, integrate, and arrange them, and he also possesses within himself what is called in alchemy the quintessence, or the fifth essence. This is a psychic spiritual energy superior to the elements, by the agency of which these elements can be bound and unbound, held together in conformity with the laws governing the human creation. The, this quintessence, or fifth power, was known to both the Pythagoreans and the Paracelsians as the soul, which permeated the flesh of Adam, ensouled him, so that he became indeed a living being. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So the fifth element, as it were, that's described in some of these alchemical workings and various other places here through the secret schools and through these teachings, the fifth element is soul as described here by Paracelsus and Pythagoras. It's also the ether, folks. And this is why the concept of ether physics has been rejected in the modern era. They don't want people to think in terms of spiritual things. So they don't want people to understand that there's this substrate that undergirds our reality, this medium in which everything exists, and it's a spiritual type medium. It's the ether. It's the substance of soul. It's something that can't be physically perceived in a normal way by our five senses here. But it is definitely something that exists and is there. It's a medium through which all things permeate into this reality. And it's an important linking idea here. It's an important connection between man and God, and man, and the spiritual ideas here. So this is the field that binds everything together. Soul. So it's important to have that concept uh, mentioned here in various regards. So we transcend just these basic physical elements in many ways because we consist of not only each of the four primary physical elements here, but we also have this linkage to this fifth element, the ether, the soul, that permeates mankind. It interpenetrates all things here. So it's important to understand that, that this quintessence is also a thing when referred to in the alchemical processes and in various of these teachings. So there's more to the story, as it were. Paracelsus explains that we, we come to know the elements because we have a certain experience of them through our sensory perceptions and our intellectual powers. We know that the earth extends beneath our feet. We can touch solid substances and know them to have structure, weight, shape, and size. Bodies grow from the earth, and the more corporeal parts of these bodies are the earth 
earthy link, sorry, of these, let me start that sentence over. Bodies grow from the earth, and the more corpor corporeal parts of these bodies are of the earth earthy, like the trunk of a tree or the bones of animals. Such forms belong to the physical element of earth. They are derived from it, and ultimately they return to it again. Man is also sustained and supported by liquids, which together the ancients called the water element. The human being can live much longer without food than without water. Yet this very water which preserves him, and of which his body is largely composed, can also destroy him. That is, he can drown or become dropsical in his own flesh. Man must also possess the principle of heat or fire in order to exist, and Paracelsus believed that the heat-radiating center in the body was the liver. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So remember that. This is an important thing within these occult sciences. The liver is the source of the heat or the fire, the essence of fire in the man. The thing that which makes you live, the liver easy to remember right and this some speculate this is how that organ got its name the liver uh, so it's an interesting thing to think about when we look at medical sciences and how important is the liver to us it's our body's primary filter we know that in our modern biology and science right so without this filter we we really can't function we won't live so this, you know, according to the occultists, this is the, the organ wherein the fire resides and penetrates out into us from. So when you think of it that way, when these toxic elements that enter your body get filtered through the liver, they get burned out of you in a sense, don't they? Uh, so this, this perhaps is one of the ideas associated also with the liver and how it relates to the fire, the element of fire within man. But let's continue on. Without heat, man must die. But with too much heat, he can also be consumed. So fire is both a friendly and a dangerous element. The last of these elements, it's air. And without this, man can survive only a few moments. He discovers his indebtedness when he climbs to a high altitude and experiences difficulty because of the rarefied atmosphere. He lives within air as the fish lives within water, and the pressure of air upon his body is likewise essential to his survival. Paracelsus resolved to explore the mysteries of these four elements through the cooperation of which man lives and moves and has his being. He decided that these elements are not merely substances heaped together or stratified or aggregated for the simple convenience of man. Each has an existence apart from man. Every element has its own boundaries, its own laws and rules, and each contributes to the maintenance of compound structures because of an internal virtue or energy factor. Such elements, therefore, are indeed rivers of life, and man, in order to retain his physical economy, must preserve the balance of these elements in his body at all times, which he does by means of nutrition, and even the introduction of talismans and magical formulas. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. So you see, the occultists, they do have their reasons for using things like talismans and magical formulas. They certainly do believe that these things can affect their physical well-being, and perhaps they're right about that. Who could say for sure? But once again, nutrition takes utmost importance. So why is it that they tinker with our food? Hmm? Why do they play with our food supplies? Well, this is probably precisely why. It's an imperative thing for the human being to live, and... If we are eating food that's not necessarily good food, that's mostly artificial, we're not getting life-sustaining elements that are found in nature, and we're having deficiencies, and therefore not maintaining the balance of these various elements, as described here by Manly P. Hall and also Paracelsus. Let's continue reading. Elements are not always visible, nor is man able to solve their mystery completely by merely observing their effects in his own life. 
Fire, for example, is a spontaneous element arising here, disappearing there, blazing forth from the volcano or from the striking of flint and steel. A fire may disappear, burn out, leaving only cold embers. But the principle or spirit of fire remains, and it may be conjured into manifestation by those requiring its assistance. Each of the elements in the Paracelsian theory is actually a kind of a world, a sphere interpenetrating the spheres of the other elements yet possessing qualities of its own. Thus there are four spheres, earth the most visible, physical and fixed, water, physical but mutable, fire sometimes visible in combustion and more mutable, and finally air usually invisible and to be discovered, as in the case of wind, when it causes some physical thing to move, like the swaying of branches or the filling of a sail. All physical elements are therefore twofold, possessing a causal nature, essentially invisible, and a nature according to effect or consequence, usually visible to some degree. going to pause for a moment here, folks. So, cause and effect. These elements, their essence is invisible, and but we can see their effects visibly. So that's what's being said here. So that being the case, this gives a different perspective to cause and effect situations, doesn't it? It's not always something physical or material. These things happen in the unseen realms. These essences of these physical elements manifest first in the invisible realm before they show their effects here in the physical realm, right? In the visible world. So they work in a different type of a way from what we may think because Paracelsus describes them as working in a different type of world altogether. You see, each one has its own individual type world, the world of fire, the world of water, world of air, world of earth. And they have different forms and substance here in our physical realm that we could experience through our five senses. And it really makes you wonder about the cause and effect relationship in certain ways. I mean, we observe certain phenomena, for sure, and we can attribute certain things to certain phenomena. But once again, I'll make the distinction here. that It's a good example to use. There's a difference between the fire and the flame. You see, the fire is the invisible heat, the invisible heat radiance that is not seen but felt, and the flame itself is the visible portion, the one that gives off the light. This is the, the physical manifestation of the fire, the flame. And they use this in the philosophies all the time, this type of an, a, a way of thinking. This relates back to the teachings of the black sun, as it were, and things like that. That would be the invisible source of the visible sun, you see. And a lot of these things, they, they go across the bounds of what our normal thinking for this era that we live in are. And that's largely because of the scientific mindset we've been given. We've lost touch with the philosophical common sense way of thinking in terms of these things. So it's good to explore these ideas, and I would very much like to um, explore further here the ideas of Paracelsus, because they still hold up today, even though the, the bulk of our society would reject some of these ideas ad nauseum, there's still a certain logic to them that really stands up today. It's common sense thinking. And that's much of the problem in our world today, is we've lost common sense thinking from the equation here. We believe the most absurd things, sight unseen, because some expert in a white lab coat tells us so. Think about that. Whereas this is something you can observe yourself, these types of things. For instance, you, you know that there's air all around us, but you don't see it. But you would certainly notice right away if it was gone, because you wouldn't be able to breathe. Likewise, you don't always see the effects that of the air, this thing that is here, that is present. 
Not all the time, but if you look out the window and see the wind blowing the tree branches around, then you understand, oh, okay, the wind is blowing, the air is moving about. So you see proof of manifestation here of this element in that way. So that's just one example here, but let's continue reading because there's a lot of ground still to cover here tonight. Paracelsus explained that these spheres of the four elements are subject to a certain kind of scientific analysis if man possesses internal faculties beyond the objective sense perceptions. Man, by virtue of his own constitution, lives in a world of three dimensions, but he is surrounded by a universe in which there are an infinite number of dimensions beyond human experience. A dimension is more than a mere division or expression of extant or, spate or expanse. The element spheres expand into dimensions beyond us and are finally lost to our comprehension in the concept of space, which is actually the reservoir of dimension. There are forms in nature which are not three-dimensional or two-dimensional or one-dimensional as we apply such terms. There are also forms in which there are many more dimensions than we have ever recognized. Paracelsus further believed that man possesses powers and latent faculties by which it is possible for him to gradually become aware of a many-dimensioned universe. This will mean the ultimate conquest of space through the realization that there is no such thing as space, but merely an infinite expanse of unfolding areas of visible or invisible, known or unknown life, energy, and substance. There is no vacuum in the universe, and the nearest thing to a vacuum, according to Paracelsus, was the brain of one of his fellow professors at Basel University. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So... We see here Paracelsus, in his common sense way of thinking, expounds upon the idea of space, as does Manly P. Hall here. What is space? What is the nature of space? Well, NASA tells us it's a vacuum. It's a 10 to the negative 13 tor power vacuum. And this is the nature of outer space, as it were. That's what they claim. Paracelsus tells us there's no such thing as a vacuum. I think he's correct. We cannot observe one in the natural world anywhere. Not a true vacuum anyway. We don't observe that. There's no vacuous place. There's no lack of substance anywhere that we can observe in this universe that we live in. It's just simply not there. Now we do have the mystery of space. And now we see this description given here by Paracelsus. Paracelsus describes space as the realization there's no such thing as space, but merely an infinite expanse of unfolding areas of visible or invisible, known or unknown, life, energy, and substance. So this whole concept of space and space being a vacuum is nonsense according to the old ways of thinking because it's not something that's ever been observed in the natural world. There's no lack in nature. And this is another thing that they most certainly push in today's modern era is this whole scarcity agenda. And it is an agenda and it is a false paradigm. There's abundance here. We have abundance. There is no supply shortage of any sort. We don't have resources that are going to run out. We cannot possibly overpopulate this place. It's not going to happen. Yet they, they keep pushing that agenda. And they push for things like population reduction, according to it. But here we see the idea of space as presented to us. It's misdescribed, and we've always said that. According to Paracelsus, there's no vacuum in the universe. No vacuum. A vacuum would be the absolute absence of matter. No such thing. We've never observed that. And they'll even say, yes, uh, space isn't even a perfect vacuum, if you really press them on it. That they have this zero point, as they call it, this 
zero point influx where they claim this is the claim in mainstream science okay this goes ties back to these quantum ideas and stuff because they simply don't know and can't explain so they come up with these ideas so they observe that yes uh, atoms of of matter will spontaneously jump into and out of being in the vacuum of space in the void they there's still these very tiny minuscule amounts of matter that just seem to phase in and out in this this way and this is what they refer to as zero point where they could get zero point energy uh, counter space these things just you know spin in and out from counter space into space and back again so there's absolutely no true absolute vacuum in the universe one's never been experienced one's never been observed and recorded anywhere and they will make claims that outer space is the vacuum when it's clearly not. So uh, we're given a misdescription. I think we're led to believe certain things that may not be true just based upon what they want our worldview to be. They don't want us to think in these ways. And Paracelsus was one of these guys that made real observations and came to real conclusions based upon his observations and people have not, to this day, proven him wrong on these things. Although they'll tell you this is a backwards way of thinking. And we know so much more now. We're so much more sophisticated, the modern man, than this. These were backwards, superstitious people back then that believed these things or these ideas. But Paracelsus tells you, in no uncertain terms, the description they give us of space is false. So... Let's keep that in mind as we continue reading here. Man, on certain occasions, may be able to break through some of the dimension binders which hold his consciousness in psychological restraint. This can occur in sleep or in the dream state. Paracelsus belonged to that group of philosophers who maintained that our comparative ignorance on the subjective side of our own lives was due mostly to our hypnotic addiction to objectivity. The consciousness of the small child, not having been adversely conditioned by what we call the reasonable, retains faculties by which he may penetrate some of the dimensional boundaries and become aware of invisible creatures or participate in experiences which are not of this world. Later, however, ridicule and the pressure of common opinion contribute to the loss of the extra faculties and their perceptions. Going to pause for a moment here, folks. Children tend to experience more supernatural events than adults, do they not? I think everybody in their childhood has some type of unexplainable phenomenon that happens around them. And this is an idea I would like to explore further on, a, on an upcoming program here sometime soon, because there are very many of these types of things that happen. And it seems that the mind of a child is more open to this than the adult. And we tend to block things out after a certain age, and I think largely it's recognized in many of the occult teachings that after about the age of seven, children begin to lose some of their sensitivities to some of the happenings in these other dimensions or other worlds or of these other forces that interpenetrate our world. And therefore, they lose touch with that completely. Now there's something to this seven-year cycle as well and we may explore that avenue of thought someday as well here in the near future because this is a fascinating thing they say your tastes change every seven years the things you like to eat and whatnot and there's some old traditions that go back that say that every seven years your body regenerates and it c turns into something different than it was prior just slightly and this is a transformational evolutionary process, according to some of the secret schools. And this is this happens. It's a natural cyclical thing every seven years. So the age of seven and, I'm, and the age of 14, 21. And I mean, just look at the physical changes that happen in your body around about these times. So there's something to the idea of this, this seven-year cycle, as it were. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. I don't want to sidetrack here too much tonight. But I just found it interesting that uh, Paracelsus is pointing out this idea that children 
tend to have more of these types of experiences or able to perceive certain things that much of the adult world does not. And they're often just dismissed out of hand with many of these experiences that they have. And that's just the way of things. And of course, a lot of this comes back to cultural context and stuff as well. But let's continue reading. To make his point as simple as possible, Paracelsus devotes some consideration to the element of water. We all know that the seas and oceans, rivers and streams, and even the old family rain barrel as are worlds populated with living things that, whose ways of life differ from our own, but are well adapted to the element in which they exist. Visible water is only a small part of the liquid element. The whole sphere of water, visible and invisible, terrestrial and sidereal, may therefore also be a habitable region. Could we see this region? It might unfold as a varied and wonderful landscape. There could be rocks composed only of the humid principle, mountains and valleys, plants and animals, some resembling human beings, others without any correspondence in our mortal experience. Actually, all this wonderful world is differentiated within one substance only. It is not a compound, but this does not mean that it cannot support or advance the destinies of the creatures developing within it. If nature produces a sphere or plane of substance or activity, it does not leave this creation lifeless and forlorn. Every dimension of environment sustains living things, even as the visible earth sustains its diversity of flora and fauna. Thus, there is a twofold world of earth, one visible and the other invisible, and the same is true of water, of fire, and of air. These elements are also worlds, and these worlds are inhabited. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. As always, I will caution you to take some of this stuff with a grain of salt, as it were, because there's truly no way to ultimately prove this idea. But it makes some sense, some of the things that Manly P. Hall and Paracelsus have said here, that perhaps there is another facet to the, these various elements that we experience, that our world is a compound of. These singular elements, perhaps there's another sphere. And I like the idea here, and this, this is actually a, a pretty intelligent observation here, made by Manly P. Hall. So he's talking about there certainly is the physical aspect, the visible concept of this world, but there's also what he calls a sidereal aspect to it. And perhaps this might be one of the key concepts here to understand. What we would call a sidereal world. This is something completely separate, but interconnected with our world. I like that word as a descriptive concept here. So he says, thus there is a twofold world of earth, one visible and the other invisible. And he says the same is true for each of these elements. And he says here that this region, it may have all kinds of different life forms in it that we might see as familiar and others that we would be completely unfamiliar with. So he calls this a terrestrial and a sidereal world, the visible and invisible. And isn't it interesting to think that uh, many in the field of ufology and UFO studies have observed some of these same types of ideas before, and people who study the idea of consciousness as well. All these ideas kind of co-mingle together when you look at this. Perhaps there are worlds that exist, that coexist, sidereally to ours. And maybe, when we see a manifestation of this, this might be described as aliens, as some of the ufologists would claim. I think the nature of that whole phenomenon is completely different from how it's described. I don't think we have actual physical beings that come here from other planets in their spaceships and visit here. 
And, you know, I would certainly say there are UFO researchers like Jacques Vallée who echo that idea that that's not necessarily the case, that it has more of a tie to the supernatural, to the occult, to the idea of these co-mingled secret worlds, that they're here and, and they're not from out there somewhere, that they're from right here. They're ultra-terrestrial. I've heard that term thrown around as well. So perhaps they're describing something similar going on here. But like I said, I would caution you, as always, take this stuff with a grain of salt. There's no way to prove nor disprove any of this. And I reserve the right to be totally wrong about any of my observations with all of this. It's just trying to understand and break down some of these mysterious forces that are at play in our world and some of these experiences that we have and these things that we can see manifest at certain times that we have no plausible explanation for. And I think sometimes if you go back and look at the philosophies of these older generations, you find more plausible explanations for things than we do with our modern science, which can't explain at all these things. So it does not accept them to be true in any way, shape, or form. If it can't explain it, it doesn't exist. And this is the wrong mindset, because there have always been things that are unexplainable, by any system of science or any system of philosophy. There's just these things that happen, and we would describe this as supernatural, wouldn't we? Or in some other way, paranormal. Paranormal, supernatural. And these topics has always fascinated me. Since the time I was a young child, I've had some experiences as a child that uh, are unexplainable, especially by modern science. And I've always had a very inquisitive mind, so I always researched this stuff. From my time of youth, I've always been interested in those types of subjects. And I would read what I could find on it, or watch whatever television programs were around at the time on these various things. Which wasn't a lot, compared to the information that we are overwhelmed with today, with the internet. So, there's many avenues of thought to explore, but I, I find this... An interesting take on things, at the very least. So let's continue reading, because there's still more to cover here. These creatures of such invisible planes are called by the Paracelsian mystics elementals. This is because each is composed of a single element, with both the advantages and disadvantages of an uncompounded constitution. All elementals differ from human beings in two respects. First, they have a body composed of only one element. And second, they do not have a soul, because the soul itself arises in compound bodies and cannot find a habitation appropriate to itself in forms composed of single elements. Actually, in the case of elementals, spirit, soul, and body are not differentiated because these creatures have not been individualized as man has been. Being thus undifferentiated, they do not possess moral natures. That is, they are amoral. They are neither good nor bad. In this, they resemble animals. They do not worship, nor do they fear any evil. They are not frightened by death, nor are they constituted for immoral immortality. They have an existence without conflict. Because there is no stress or pressure as must exist in compound beings, their constitutions are not subject to wear or exhaustion. These elemental beings can therefore exist for a very long time in comparison to man, and when their existence ends, they dissolve again into the substance from which they came. Because all four elements are material but not physical, their corresponding beings are also essentially material, though not physical, as we understand that term, they are subject to the laws of generation and attain a certain gradual evolution within the elemental field to which they belong. By their constitution, however, the growth which they attain advances the element itself rather than the nature of the separate beings. Paracelsus, following the concepts of Greece, Egypt, India, and China, divided elemental beings into four groups. 
Of these, he considered the earth spirits, or the gnomes, to be the most closely associated with matter, the water spirits, he calls undines, or nymphs, the fire spirits, salamanders, and the air spirits, sylphs. Paracelsus also indicates that the elementals not only live within their particular elements, but are the administrators of the processes associated with the elements. In other words, we seem to perceive a certain intelligence operating in the relationships of elements and creatures. We observe the growth of metals in the earth, and how fishes have a certain instinctive knowledge of the rules governing their own existences. This is likewise true of animals, birds, and of the larger expressions of elements in storms, the formations of clouds, whirlpools, eddies, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions. It is scarcely necessary for us to enlarge the stories relating to elementals. We can, however, summarize the Paracelsian concept. Elementals are divided into races and groups. They have their homes, they are ruled over by kings and princes, they perform innumerable tasks, busying themselves in their world, as we, we busy ourselves with the problems of our dimension and existence. Occasionally, these elementals come into our own sphere of awareness, because our natures include the substances within which the elementals exist. Legends like the story of Undyne, the beautiful accounts of the Greek nymphs, and of gnomes revealing their treasures to mortals for whom they have a friendship, are regarded by us as pure fiction. But Paracelsus recommended that the subject may be given further examination. In his philosophy, Paracelsus also differentiated an entirely different group of invisible creatures, referring to them as elementaries. At first, the term might seem confusingly similar. We must remember that an elemental is a natural creature derived from the flesh that is not the flesh of Adam, and belonging to the orderly procedure of creative processes in the universe. By contrast, the elementary is an artificial being created in the invisible worlds by man himself. In harmony with more recent findings, Paracelsus noted that most elementaries seem to be of an evil or destructive nature. They are generated from the excesses of human thought and emotion, the corruption of character, or the degeneration of faculties and powers, which should be used in other more constructive ways. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. Ever hear the term tulpa? or egregore. That's what's being referred to here. Now, Paracelsus called these elementaries. These are artificially created elementals, created by man. And he says that the vast majority of them seem to be evil. Got to wonder about that, don't you? What is being described here? So we see, is, is, is it logical to think that we have these parallel worlds interpenetrating our own? Does it seem feasible? I think it's definitely possible. Is it probable? Hard to say for sure. Is any of this true? Like I said, I always caution you, take this all with a grain of salt. This is what they, te they teach, though, in the occult paradigms here, in the occult fraternities. And perhaps there are some elements of truth to this, because I do think there are intelligences of some sort that guide certain activities here. And we do get glimpses at times into these other paranormal or supernatural states of being. So perhaps there's something to the idea. But now is where it gets really interesting when you begin to see that man has had an effect here a largely negative effect into these elemental worlds to which he is interconnected and interpenetrated by because we do consist of the four parts here man is a not only a threefold but a four square being according to the doctrines of the freemasons and the various other secret society groups and it certainly relates to these elemental ideas and they are foundational too many of the facets of our reality. 
when you look at them from the common sense perspective here. But let's continue reading and see what else Manly P. Hall can tell us about what Paracelsus taught here. A good example of the Paracelsian elementary is the incubus. This is a kind of demon which exists because when God created Adam, he breathed into him the divine power. Man is therefore a creator, not merely in the terms of the perpetuation of the species, but especially in terms of the imagination. Man is creative in arts, sciences, and philosophies, but his creative powers are not only external, but also internal. Because he lives, man bestows life, and he can generate creatures from his thoughts and emotions, even as from his flesh. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. Imagination, this is a hugely important thing, and this is why, also, in my estimation, artificial intelligence will never acquire sentience or become a living thing. It lacks this divine spark. It lacks this divine imagination. This is why all of these stupid chatbots and all of these popular things go absolutely bonkers after just a couple of days and don't seem to work properly and eventually seem to actually become self-destructive. So uh, it's because it lacks this, this thing that makes man special, right? It's this uh, creative ability. It doesn't have it. Nor can it ever have it, because we, as mere mortals, cannot bestow that upon another living thing. We don't have that capacity. We cannot incorporate life into a thing. We cannot create life out of nothing. We can maybe ma manufacture the chemicals of life and put it all together and hope for the best, and maybe produce something, but we do not give the actual divine spark to anything. The soul, we do not provide the soul or spirit or animus to the thing that happens on its own and it's a mystery that we don't understand as to why or how this happens how something could be instantiated with a spirit of life how things live and move and have their being it's still an absolute mystery Although, you know, a lot of our modern physiologists and biologists and stuff will give you all these complex descriptions of all these different cell processes and how we know this and that happens and, and through these various things this happens, but uh, they still don't understand how something comes to life. Because you could put these very same mix of chemicals and everything into a test tube and still not produce life even if it's the exact same constituent parts of a living thing. Same can be said of a body, a dead body, without a spirit in it, right? What differentiates a dead body from a living body? Th this is something that's a, a bit of a mystery. If it has all the same components, and it's not missing anything, all it's missing is the animus or spirit. Man has not the ability to instantiate this into something. Although we are a type of creator and we can manifest ideas into reality in certain ways, and I think this penetrates into these more spiritual type worlds or elementary type worlds as presented here. So it is logical to think that perhaps merely through the use of our imagination we can create, that we do have this creative power of sorts, and perhaps there's something to this idea. Now, like I said, I reserve the right to be totally wrong about that, and I always caution you, take this stuff with a grain of salt, but this is what they teach, and there seems to be some elements of truth intermingled here. So, it's worth consideration. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater when looking at this stuff. Because even if you think it's nonsense, understand that there are people in positions of power in this world that very much do believe in this stuff and act upon it. And the things they do to act upon it will affect all of us. So even if you think it's silly and nonsensical, understand there's somebody out there in positions of power, some of these dark occultists at the top of the power structure, that leverage these ideas against us and look at the state of the world as a result of that. Keep that in mind. But let's continue on here. So we left off here. I'll repeat that last part. 
Man is creative in arts, sciences, and philosophies, but his creative powers are not only external, but also internal. Because he lives, man bestows life, and he can generate creatures from his thoughts and emotions, even as from his flesh. The power to create is the power of vibration, by which anything is set into a peculiar motion. This motion is itself immortal, and contributes its own power to other things forever. The invisible progeny of man include thought forms and emotion forms. These are like infants, especially in their beginnings, for they depend upon their creator for their nutrition and survival. Later, however, if the forces which generate them continue to operate, these thought and emotion forms gain strength, finally attaining a kind of independence which is their immortality. Having thus become even stronger than their creator, these thought or emotion forms will turn upon the one who fashioned them, often causing in him a terrible habit and destroying his health and happiness. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So absolutely, he's describing what we would call an egregore or a tulpa of sorts. And I find it interesting that he's claiming that... uh, These things will turn on their creator. They'll become more powerful than their creator. Turn on their creator and destroy them. Why is that? Are all of these thought forms and emotion forms negative? I don't think they all are. I don't think they'll turn around and necessarily destroy their creator, this person. I don't think we have that inherent power to create something greater than ourselves. No creation can ever be greater than its creator. That's a logical fallacy. So to say that this creation can become more powerful or greater than its creator is a logical fallacy on the face of it. That's the same thing as saying man can be greater than God. But of course, that is what they teach in these secret schools. That's what they want people to believe, so I don't find that as being far from what their agenda is, and perhaps that's why they present this idea in this way. And there is definitely something to the idea of the tulpa, or the egregore, as it were, or as described here by Paracelsus, the elementary, which is different than the elemental, the unnatural type of elemental in a sense, the elementary the man-created thing, the artificial, springing into being, an object of the imagination of mankind. And we see so much of that has permeated our culture today. There's many man-made concepts that have come about around us that are actually bringing destruction upon us. So, like I said, maybe there's some truth to the things being said. A lot of it has these spiritual contexts and connotations involved with it, but I don't think imagination in and of itself is a bad thing, or being able to create something in your imagination is a bad thing, as it's being represented here. So something different is afoot with this. Let's continue reading and see what else we could obtain here, information-wise, from the Paracelsian teachings. Man may also create by the power of his speech. Among Orientals addicted to hashish and other drugs have reported their ability, while under the influence of these narcotics, to see words coming out of the human mouth. These words appear as luminous forms or patterns. Paracelsus tells us substantially the same thing. Entities thus created by thought, emotion, or the spoken words are further sustained by the continual flowing of energy from the person. If such support is not sufficient, a kind of vampirism sets in, and the elementary, like a parasitic plant, drains the energy of the human body to support its own growth. It becomes a psychic tumor, surviving at the expense of the organism to which it is attached. Much of the information gathered by Paracelsus relating to the incubus is interesting from a psychological standpoint. We know that the human psyche can become ridden with pressure centers or pressure patterns, which we call fixations, complexes, phobias, and the like. We know that these negative psychic formations are nourished by the continual repetition of the attitudes which caused them. 
We say that negative attitudes become habitual by degrees taking over and destroying the mental and emotional integrity of the individual. A fixation well nourished by attitudes suitable for its perpetuation intensifies, becoming actually avaricious and resolved to dominate or possess the entire life of its unhappy victim. This again suggests the Paracelsian analogy between the incubus and the parasite. Just as a beautiful orchid or the mistletoe plant lives partly from the air and partly from the tree to which it is attached, so the incubus or the phobia is an unlawful being, surviving not because its roots are in nature, but at the expense of another living organism whose vital forces will be vampirized. And I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. And I will also point out that there are other aspects of this that are explored in these occult teachings that they call the human double or the doppelganger or the aramonic double as it were and perhaps this is the entity which vampirizes in the parasitic type way these things so that being the case let's keep that in mind as we continue on here Modern thinking, therefore, sheds a light upon the concept of elementaries, extending beyond the basic research of Paracelsus. We observe today the tremendous increase in mental pathology. We know that attitudes which become more and more fixed lead to what science calls a state of obsession. Paracelsus used the term obsession to signify possession by an entity. Today, the term is used to signify possession by an abnormal attitude. What is the fact of the matter? It is possible that the abnormal attitude has gradually become an entity. We may prefer not to assume such a belief, but how can we completely explain this peculiar and continuous undermining of the consciousness and morality of a human being? Once a destructive attitude has come into possession of life, the person is gradually devoured by the Added that attitude, which appears to become more and more possessive. Many persons under psychological obsession resist treatment, as though some foreign creature were fighting for its own survival in them. Often, indeed, in a mental illness, the patient, instead of desiring to recover, becomes defensive of his ailment, defending abnormalcy more courageously than he would ever defend normalcy. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So what do we see going on in society today? Let's repeat that last part. Often, indeed, in a mental illness, the patient, instead of desiring to recover, becomes defensive of his ailment, defending abnormalcy more courageously than he would ever defend normalcy. Look around at the world today, folks. I think this is an obvious statement, isn't it? So perhaps there's some underlying cause to this within a spiritual context here. Now this is as Paracelsus describes it, the, an incubus spirit, some such thing like that, that we would consider demonic, but it's an elementary spirit, as he calls it here, an artificially created element, or elemental, I should say, created by the human mind that manifests, and perhaps... This is some of what underlies psychological conditions in mankind, as it were. Hard to say for sure, but I think it's worth consideration, isn't it? Perhaps our cause and effect relationships that we observe in these things are incorrect, and something like this is maybe more akin to what is really happening. Maybe there's something to this, or maybe not. Like I said, got to take it all with a grain of salt. And I reserve the right to be totally wrong about any of it. But it seems to me that uh, people have thought about this stuff for a long time. And have observed these very many things from different perspectives. And from the perspective of the causal nature within the invisible worlds that we don't see. We only see the visible manifestations of this cause from these invisible worlds. So that being the case, is there some type of a spirit manifestation that generates from 
human thoughts, especially negative human thoughts, and attaches itself parasitically to a person is the concept of the human double, the doppelganger, the aramonic double. Is there something to that? Does that relate to this idea that Paracelsus calls the elementary? Perhaps. There's always been talk of vampirism and energy vampirism from time immemorial. Perhaps this is a manifestation of such a thing, and this is one explanation as to where or how it manifests. Let's continue reading, because there's still some things I would like to cover before we sign off here tonight. Much has also been written on the subject of vampires. The mysterious undead who live upon the blood of the living and can be destroyed only when a stake is driven through their hearts. In Paracelsian psychology, the vampire also plays an interesting role. There seems to be an analogy with what might be termed collective manias. To become a vampire, we must first be the victim of a vampire. This evil creature can function only at night and must sleep forever in its own earth. Many psychological ailments seem to be communicated by the pressures of one person, adversely influencing the life of another. We have great psychoses shared by multitudes of persons, such as fear of war, crime, sickness, poverty, and death. Once we have been attacked by these fears, we become like them. We perpetuate negative thought and emotion forms, preserving our own bad habits by causing others to share them. Destructive thought patterns therefore organize into groups, and in each of these groups there are millions of persons exemplifying the same destructive and morbid tendencies. These, according to Paracelsus, result in collective thought forms, which will become attached to persons who make themselves available through a basic kind of negation. The individual then simply becomes receptive to the pressures of his world, allows these pressures to move in until he finally becomes another unit in the pressure group, adding his negative influence to the already tragic condition. In the Paracelsian doctrine, there is, however, a solid sense of justice. In order to be a victim of elementaries of any kind, the individual must be potentially given to excessive attitudes or destructive habits. The kindly person, fully occupied in useful endeavors, will not open his nature to infection or contagion. Actually, the elementary is closely associated with imagination, which can be a distorting and deforming force in the life of the individual. In the aloneness of his private living, the melancholy person becomes filled with self-pity, deludes himself, convinces his mind that he is the victim of injury or neglect, and finally prepares his nature for the development of one of these psychic entities. Recovery must therefore be a reversal of process, in which faith, friendship, understanding, tolerance, and good humor break the vicious cycle and deprive the obsession of its needed nutrition. Out of his philosophy of elementaries, Paracelsus came to the conclusion that a very large part of what we consider to be physical disease results from psychic parasites generated by wrong thought and emotion. He did not go so far as to insist that attitudes are the sole cause of sickness, but he regarded them as extremely important factors. Furthermore, wrong attitudes will reduce the probability of recovery and leave the patient without the proper energy for the reorientation of his career. Gradually, the obsessing entity or elementary sets up physical equivalents in the body which symbolize the state of the soul and the interior sickness of the mind and heart. I'm going to pause for a moment here, folks. So there are still some people that use these same types of concepts today, these Paracelsian teachings. Are they correct? Maybe. Maybe there's something to them. Absolutely, there is an observable difference between those with a positive attitude and a negative attitude in their outcomes. This has been scientifically validated even by our questionable science today. So <laughs> that should tell you something. I mean, I think that's a pretty obvious thing on the face of it. Attitude's everything. And the, ex the experiments of Dr. Emoto on the water shows that you can put your intention into a thing and it makes all the difference so perhaps this 
is one of the keys with this elementary idea as given here by Paracelsus. Let's continue reading here and we'll wrap it up here real soon. Paracelsus was enough of a psychologist to recognize that the black magician of medieval sorcery is simply the black psychic side of ourselves. The dishonest person seeking to gain by unlawful ends certain securities or advantages normally reserved for those of proper attainments becomes a kind of sorcerer who, with spells and incantations, tries to fulfill his own selfishness. Thus, a person living an apparently respectable life, but inwardly filled with hatreds, morbid emotion, and destructive attitudes, is creating another being within his own magnetic field, a kind of second and negative self. This is suggested in the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. In the Paracelsian period of human activity, it was believed that certain persons had attendant demons or familiar spirits who served their bidding for a time and then claimed the immortal soul of the magician. This is the Mephisto who attached himself to Faust as the result of what has been called the Faustian complex. This Mephisto is ever whispering in our ear that we may do as we please, regardless of consequences, and we agree because we desire to agree, but if we follow this course and listen to this demonical voice, our satanic imp will ultimately carry us away to his own infernal region. Contrary to general opinion, Paracelsus did not believe that our private elementaries, demons, and vampires could go out from us and hurt the persons we hate or wish to injure. The elementary cannot exist except within the energy field of its own creator. Destructive emotions or hatreds, therefore, can never escape from us. But having been generated and allowed to flow into the energy field, they return to us again in the forms of various disasters. The hate we turn upon another strengthens only the power to hate in ourselves. For this reason, the doctrine is soundly ethical. Our own evil destroys us, usually so slowly and mysteriously, that we do not understand the procedure. We are reminded always that evil is its own punishment, even as good is its own greatest reward. Paracelsus also had another theory, which perhaps will seem incredible to us, yet it deals with a subject which we have never satisfactory so satisfactorily solved. This has to do with the problem of germs, bacterial organisms, and viruses, those microforms of life that are so dangerous to the health of ordinary mortals. Paracelsus believed that the germ, or its equivalent, is a psychic entity created by creatures possessing mental and emotional powers. He pointed out that epidemical disease usually accompanies outbreaks of destructive human intensity. War, for example, is nearly always accompanied by a plague and also by violent seismic disorders. By this way of thinking, the Swiss Hermes points out the danger of overloading those processes of nature by means of which physical, emotional, and mental pollution is neutralized or overcome. We are now concerned with water pollution and with the pollution of air, as in the smog problem. Paracelsus believed that the psychic fields of the world which must absorb the psychic toxins arising from the negative dispositional characteristics of mental and emotional creatures, can become so polluted that they can no longer cleanse themselves with sufficient rapidity. The result is the rise of psychic toxin in the energy field of the planet. As all creatures inhabiting this planet must derive their energies and life substances from this field, its pollution causes widespread lowering of vitality and morality. When this occurs, the general health and optimism of the race are afflicted. People complain of intangible ills and are inclined to a common morbidity or to the neglect of activities which are healthful and psychically normal and sustaining. Paracelsus therefore believed that the solution to the problem of health was the realization that only the wise and the good can be happy and well. This does not mean that Paracelsus himself was never ill. He realized that he lived in a society which made freedom from sickness almost impossible. 
He believed, however, that we could minimize our dangers through the cultivation and preservation of defensive vitality. We can keep our psychic nature free from elementaries and protect our energy fields from the parasitical attitudes which drain our vital resources. In early works on medicine, it is often noticed that representations of diseases are in the form of clouds of demon-like insects. These attack the sick man from all directions, and most certainly represent the evils in his own nature contributing to his discomfort. Paracelsus was a minister of goodwill among men. He believed that it was the duty of the human being to establish constructive relationships with the intelligent universe existing around him. Nature is by essential purpose kindly and benign and has provided man with innumerable resources and opportunities, but through the perversion of his power and the pollution of his mental emotional life, man has created a situation which has caused him to assume that the world is evil. If, however, he establishes harmonic sympathies with universal life, he will make friends he knows not of. We are reminded of the story of the kindly peasant to whom the earth dwarfs cheerfully revealed their treasure. Even as the incubus is the product of man's destructive emotion, so there is a guardian angel generated from good thoughts and right emotions. There are good spirits to attend to the good man, because he has created them, and they serve him gladly. He is rewarded according to the merit of his deeds, and if he finds depletion and depression invading his life, he should realize the strange chemistry of the elements and principles upon which he depends for existence. Through the proper use of his faculties, man builds a wonderful armor of protection around his life. And we're going to wrap it up right there, folks. So you see, the idea of elemental spirits, elementals, these intelligences that guide things in the natural world here. These old ideas, they were brought into the more modern era by Paracelsus. Described in this way, he categorized them. And he categorized this other subcategory, these artificially created elementals, known as elementaries in his viewpoint. These would be demonic type entities and more of the modern vernacular or way of thinking in the religious context, as we would call it. These were are things that are described in modern occultism as tulpas or egregores. They're also described in certain regards as the human double, the doppelganger, the aramonic double. This influence that we all have if you want to look at modern psychological terms, we could call it the id, the ego, and the superego. All these different breakdowns. These concepts all interrelate. They all go back to these ancient mystery schools, all these teachings. And perhaps there is some kind of a spiritual connotation or connection to what we would call an elemental type spirit. Maybe there is some kind of permutation here between these various elemental worlds and our own. Maybe they do interrelate. Maybe there are other living things, things we would consider living things, but just wouldn't be able to define them in the terms of our five physical senses here. These things are all worth considering. It's a different way of thinking from our modern thought forms here in our scientific paradigm that we're in. But certainly... These ideas are fun to explore, for sure. And they do make you think outside the box and reevaluate what this world around us really consists of. Because at the end of the day, none of us really know for sure, do we? So I think it's worth considering these things from every angle. And usually Manly P. Hall puts out a lot of pretty good information, for the most part. There's always that bit of poison mixed in with all of these secret society teachings and whatnot, but it gives you the perspective of what the controllers of this world know that we don't, or what it is that they think that they know. And this is just part and parcel of that. This is probably pretty basic stuff for those people to understand that there's some type of an intelligence that guides the different processes of this world what we would call elementals, that there's this natural energy force that guides these things intelligently, the development thereof. 
And it relates back to the sky clock once again as well, as we pointed out here in the beginning of this reading tonight. How all these ideas are interpenetrated within one another. So it's worth considering. So if we know this, if we understand this information, we could see how it is that those at the top of the power structure seek to manipulate us in many ways. And we could better understand our own strengths and weaknesses. Because perhaps, as suggested by Paracelsus, we have these negative attachments to ourselves. They're self-generated from our own imaginations because we do have that creative power, according to the ancient mystics. We have dominion here, according to the Bible. That being the case, we were also in the Bible, created in the image of God. So being created in the image of God, who is the creator, that gives us a certain creative aspect ourselves. And we need to be responsible with that. And the Bible always advises us to be careful of our thoughts, to guide our thoughts, consider our thoughts, think only on those good and pure and righteous things. Perhaps there's more tangible reasoning to that than what we might think, and it might have something to do with this. Of course, like I always say, take this stuff with a grain of salt. But it is worth consideration in my view, and it's always good to have more information rather than less. So that's why I put this stuff out there. Anyway, folks, that's all I have for tonight. I hope this was informational, and I hope you all enjoyed it. And once again, I always want to thank you all for listening. I appreciate each and every one of you. We'll catch you next time. Have a good night, all. Come with me.